It's like a pseudo final. So it's not going to be until week 14. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Nothing. The only thing I want you to focus on now is just the project. And so I, I, I didn't, I used to have a midterm exam around this time last time, but then everyone complained that it overlapped with the project. And so I just want you to focus on the project now, and then we'll do an exam near the end. All right. Yeah. You're saying <laughs> 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 I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, it's uh, 2.30, so let's go ahead and get started today. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? How's, I'm good, thanks. How's everyone doing after the uh, the daylight savings? Everyone's tired of bed. I, uh, I was up late on Saturday night, um, not working, I was, I, was, I was playing video games, but I, I looked up at the clock, it was 1.55, and then I looked again, it was 3 o'clock, I was like, man, what the hell just happened? Um, so that's daylight savings for you. And uh, it's Pi Day, so happy Pi Day, everyone. It's uh, March, uh, March 14th, so that's 3.14. Um, so, you know, for, for, for those of us in math and engineering, this is a, a fun day, although, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of embarrassing to celebrate outside of an engineering classroom because people look at you like you're an idiot. But, you know, I'm always happy that it's Pi Day. I'm going to go to the market, get a pie today to celebrate. So, you know, um, just because I, I can't, right? It's not breaking my diet if it's Pi Day, okay? All right, and so um, I know a lot of you have noticed this already, so I finished grading the midterm, and so I, I have them here, and so I'll give them back to you after class. Um, you guys did really well. So the average in the, in the class is 36.86, if you want to be exact, uh, out of 50, and so that's about a 73, uh, almost 74%. So that's, that's, that's pretty good. So that's kind of almost right on the nose with kind of where I, uh, you know, where I want the average to be. Uh, I remember, you know, like, like we talked about last week, you know, I'm going to do grade adjustment if the final class average is below 77. And so this is about where it should be because, you know, with the ad, with the homeworks, the homeworks tend to bump up the grades a little bit. And so we're kind of right where we should be in this class. So, you know, overall, I, I was very happy. So you guys did really, really well. Okay. Um, and so you guys can pick that up after class. So I, I tried my best to, you know, to write as many comments as I could, um, you know, just to let you know whenever, wherever I took off points, I gave you, make sure I made sure to give you feedback. Um, but if you have any questions about about any of the comments I made or, or why you lost any points, then you know definitely let me know because I am I am you know. And if I added up your points wrong or if you think you deserve more points, then let me know too because you know I'm I'm human and so you know I graded these um, you know I I always try to grade I always try to grade the exams you know no more than a week after after you guys take them you know but because of that you know I, I make some mistakes and so you know it's uh, um, and that's totally fine and so you know you. Uh, if you notice a mistake, then just let me know, and I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, to correct it. Okay. All right, question in the chat. Um, if we do not attend class, do you still have the... Uh, yes, if so, if you... I would, I would prefer that you get the hard copy, but if, but if you can't um, come to class, you know, for the next couple of weeks, then I can, I can scan it to you, but I would, I would rather not have to do that for a lot of people. And so, um, you know, and so, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you can't come to class, you know, pick it up within the next week, just let me know. I can, I can scan it. All right, and so the plan for today is we're going to continue on with our lecture notes on, ex on external convection, okay? Uh, and the other announcement I want to make is that homework four is posted. Okay. And the due date for homework four, you know, just, just so that you guys don't have anything to work on over the break, I'm going to have it due next Friday, which is the last, the last Friday before we go. Okay. So I believe that's March, um, that's March 25th.
And so, of course, you know, because that's a Friday, then, you know, if you turn it in on that day, it's going to have to be an online submission. Um, but if you do finish it beforehand, and like say you finish by next Wednesday, then you can turn it in person, and I'm happy to get that as well. Okay. Um, oh, midterm solution. So I, I will post the solutions to the midterm. So I, I, I was going to do it before the class today, but, but something kind of came up before the class, so I, I didn't get a chance to. Uh, but I will do that first thing when I get back to my office. Um, so you should see the solutions up by 4.30. Okay. Um, there were, there were two versions of the exam. So if you're gonna compare your answers you know, on your exam with the version, with the exam, make sure you're doing it for the correct version. So I'm gonna upload both, both versions of the exam. All right, and so I think that's it for my announcement. So are there other questions before we get started? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. And so uh, we were talking about external convection, okay? All right, so just to kind of remind you, you know, we're, we're looking at situations, convection situations. Uh, where the boundary layer can grow unbounded. Uh, so that's that's kind of the exact definition of this, but most of the time this happens outside, and so that's why we call this external convection. So the uh, the most characteristic example and the one that we're going to work with all today is flow over a flat plate. Okay? And so in this situation, you have air or some kind of fluid that's striking a flat plate, and your boundary your boundary layer can grow like that. Okay? And the difference between external convection and the other convection situations that we're going to cover over the next few weeks. There's nothing, there's nothing above this, or at least nothing that's remotely close to this. And so essentially we can say the boundary layer can grow, you know, without running into anything. Okay. Next week, or, or maybe at the end of this week too, we're, we're gonna cover internal convection. And in those situations, the boundary layers are actually gonna, two boundary layers are actually gonna collide with each other. Okay. Uh, but for external convection, we're only gonna worry about one. All right. And so in these situations and, and others, the way, the way that we compute, um, the way that we compute the convection coefficient is through a Neusselt number. Okay? Okay. And so what we say is that the Neusselt number, which has the symbol NU, uh, this is equal to the convection coefficient multiplied by some length divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid, okay? Right, so that's, that's just the straight up definition of the Neusselt number. And then what we also know is that through experiments that other people have conducted over the years, we also know that we can compute the Neusselt number through a combination of other factors. And so we, we went over one such correlation last time. And so the correlation we went over last time was 0 0.332 times the Reynolds number uh, with respect to X raised to the one half power. So that's the square root of the Reynolds number multiplied by Prandtl number to the one third power. Okay. And this quantity right here, this is our initial number correlation Uh, for laminar flow over a flat plate. Okay. And so if our flow is laminar and we have flow over a flat plate, then we can use this correlation here to compute the Neusselt number. And then after we compute the Neusselt number, we can use that to compute what the convection coefficient is. Okay. All right. And so that's kind of where we're going. And so, you know, the, the, whole, the whole point of this, of, this, of this week and next week and, and one more week after that um, is that we're going, to be, is we're going to be coming up with different correlations or different experimental equations for the Neusselt number that depend on the situation. Okay. 
So here's one such correlation. We're going to go over a few more today. And then, you know, every day for the next couple of weeks, we'll come up with a, um, you know, a new correlation. But the idea that I, I, I left you guys on, and, and I, had a, I had a question about this over the weekend too, um, was that we have to be really careful about how we compute the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. Okay? And the reason we have to be careful about it is, is that these quantities or the values of these numbers depend strongly on temperature. And so I think last time we, we did, uh, we went over the data for, for water, right? So water, you know, let's say that you want to compute something um, like the viscosity of water, right? And so we saw that the viscosity of water, as you vary the temperature from freezing up until, you know, not even boiling, uh, about 50 degrees um, Celsius, you know, the, uh, the viscosity changed by, by a factor of three, right? Um, and so it's about three times difference, you know, between, between those. And so, that, and so that makes a huge difference in, in your calculation. And that's especially confusing here because, you know, we have multiple temperatures in our system that we're dealing with, right? And so, for instance, you know, let's say that we have the temperature of the surface, right? And so let's say that we have a surface temperature Ts, right? And we also have an ambient temperature T infinity, right? And oftentimes these two temperatures are going to be different from each other. And so the question is, you know, if we're going to be computing if we're going to be computing these fluid properties, you know, what temperature should we evaluate them at? Because that's because that makes a big difference about which one we do. Because right? uh, oftentimes these are pretty different. So just to give you just to give you a, a simple case, you know, let's say that we're we have a hot engine part, and so let's say our surface is at something like eighty degrees C, and then for our ambient temperature, you know, we just have we just have air temperature or standard room temperature, which is pretty standard. Right? So that's twenty five degrees C. Right? And so if we evaluated things like the viscosity. The thermal conductivity, the Prandtl number, right? We, if we evaluate these things at 8 degrees C, we're going to get very different numbers than at 25. Okay. And so what we said was that we defined a new temperature called the film temperature. Okay. And so the film temperature is simply just going to be an average of these two. So we take Ts plus T infinity, and we just divide it by two. So that's a formula worth boxing. Okay. And then once you compute the film temperature, then what you do is you evaluate the fluid properties. At this temperature. Okay. Right, and so that'll give you kind of a good, a good approximation of those properties. I, I will say that it's not perfect because you know it's if you want to be really technical, then you know the properties like density and viscosity they vary very strongly as you go across the boundary layer. But this gives us a good, a good, a pretty good average at least to start with. Okay. Okay. And so, um, you know, if you if you read the lecture notes, you know what what you'll see in the lecture notes is that uh, I refer you to some textbook or table in the textbook where you can evaluate fluid properties. And so, if you have the textbook and you have the table, it's like that's that's good. You know, that's fine to do. Uh, but you know textbooks are expensive, and so you know when I was when I was in your guys' shoes, I did everything I could to avoid buying textbooks, and I don't blame you guys. I don't blame you guys for doing the same. And so I'll show you I'll show you an easier way to do this. Okay. But let me actually let me write down. So I think the textbook table was table A four. It was in, it's in the appendix. You'll probably find this this uh, if you have if you have if you still have your textbook from thermodynamics, um, then you can probably find similar tech tables there as well. But I'll show you what I've been doing recently, which is a lot easier, in my opinion, and also free. Okay. And so I'll and so I'll link this website on um, on Canvas as well. But another way that you can uh, another way that you can compute properties is you go to Google and you search up fluid properties calculator. Okay. And then I believe it's this one, University of Water. Yeah. So this is the one I like to use because it's very simple. So let's say that you want to compute, you know, the properties of air at 25 degrees C. Okay. And so you can choose your fluid. And so they don't have that many options here, but they have, 
they have air and water, which is you know 95% of most of the foods you're going to deal with. Okay. And so let's say that we want the properties at 25 degrees C. Now I'm just going to lock it not on. Okay. And so you, you change the temperature there. You can change the number of digits. Five is kind of fussy, so I'm going to change it to three. Okay. Hit compute. And then these uh, these properties over here should update based on those based on those values. Oh, I didn't see it update. So actually, let me go change this. Oh, they changed it already. Okay. And so as soon as you don't even have to calculate. So as soon as you as soon as you change the temperature, and you hit enter, then it'll change these these properties. Okay? And so I, I find this a lot easier, and, and you don't have to worry about interpolating because if you if you use the textbook table, then you have to interpolate. Um, but I find I find this to be kind of the easiest way to compute this, and this and this gives you everything that you need. So you have viscosity here, you have thermal conductivity. It even gives you the Prandtl number, which is super nice. Okay, and so you can use this this website to do basically all the problems we're going to do in, in this class. And I'll, I'll link this on the Canvas site so you'll have access to it as well. Okay, and so that's uh, and so that's a uh, a recap. And so I I know it was a uh, um, we had daylight savings, we had the midterm last week. And so I wanted to do kind of a, a more detailed recap than, than I usually do. And so are there, are there any questions about any of this before we, uh, we move on? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and, and move on. And so the next topic I wanna to go over is the difference between local and average newsletter. Oh, sorry about that. All right. And so actually, let me repeat the, uh, the formula that we had up there. Okay. And so the formula that we had up there was Newsold number is equal to 0 0.332 Reynolds number to the one half times Prample number to the one third. Okay. So this is the only neutral number correlation that we have so far, right? And what we said, this is equal to H, let me change this. So this is equal to H times X divided by K. Okay. All right. And so this correlation right here, you know, this is, this is actually only good for what's called a local neutral number, okay? And so what do I mean by local? And so remember we talked about before that, you know, because, because of the way food mechanics is, uh, the, way the, the way food mechanics works and the way you know, flow goes over an object, if you compute the instantaneous or the, the value of H at each point along a surface, you're gonna get different values, right? And so the same thing is true here for a, for a flat plate, right? And so even a flat plate, you know, which looks, you know, which looks conceptually simple, right? So here's our flat plate, here's our boundary layer. If we compute, you know, let's say that we have location one right here, right? If we compute what the, uh, what the convection coefficient is there locally, right? It's gonna be different than the value of the convection coefficient at location two, okay? Let me see, this is the local convection coefficients. Right? The local convection coefficients will be different at these two points. Okay. And the main reason is because, you know, the fluid mechanics are different at those two points, right? So at, at point one, your boundary layer has not really developed at all. It's a very small boundary layer. But at point two, you know, your boundary layer has developed a lot, okay? And so that's gonna, that's gonna make a difference in the local. Um, so that makes sense from, from a fluid mechanics point of view. But from a practical point of view, you know, from heat transfer, this is kind of annoying because, you know, if we, because a lot of times, you know, we're not really interested in, you know, what's the amount of heat transfer from that small area of, of, of space, right? What we're interested in most of the time is, you know, what's the amount of heat transfer that's going to come off this entire plate, right? Okay. And if the nuisel number and the convection coefficient is going to change as you go along the plate, 
you know, that's pretty, that's kind of annoying to deal with because, you know, you have to change it every single time. And so what's more useful for us, you know, from a, uh, from a practical point of view is to not compute a local NUSA number, but to compute an average one that, that goes across the entire surface. Okay. And so what we want is not a, a local one, but an average one. Okay. And the way that we can do that is we can use a, uh, the average value theorem from calculus, right? And so what we can say is that the average h is equal to one over the length integral from zero to L of the local h, okay? So the function of x dx. So it's simply, it's simply just the average, um, you know, the average value formula from the calculus. All right. And so what we can do then is that for this, we can plug in, you know, our, our correlation from up here, okay? And so if we plug in, right, we plug in hx of x is equal to AF divided by um, X times 0 0.332 times the rental number to the one half times parental number to the one third, okay? And then for Reynolds number, Reynolds number we plug in U infinity times X divided by mu. Okay. Then what we have is uh, what we have is this. And so we have H bar is equal to one over X times integral from zero to L okay, times 0 0.332 times KF times U infinity over mu to the one half times x to the minus one half, okay, times parental number to the one third dx, okay? And so we can evaluate this integral, or I'm sorry, this should be one over L out in front. Okay. Sorry about that. The x, the x was already inside. And so if we evaluate this integral, so I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with the, with the mathematical details. Honestly, they're not, they're not too important. but I did want to show you where this formula came from. Okay. If we evaluate this integral, then what we get is the following. Okay. And so we evaluate this integral, then what we get is, what we get is the following. So we get H bar is equal to one over L times 0 0.332 KF times U infinity over nu times one half uh, times parental number to one third, okay? We get a two that comes out of the integral and we get an L raised to the one half, okay? I'm gonna rearrange the terms a little bit. And so I'm gonna multiply an L by both sides, okay? And so on the left side, we have L times H bar. I'm gonna divide both sides by KF. And so on the left hand side here, we get KF, okay? And so this gets moved over here, this gets moved over here, okay? Then we have 0 0.332 times two times U infinity over nu raised to the one half. We have an L to the one half here, okay? And then we have a two. Oh, the two is already there. We don't have another two. We have a parental number. Parental number to one third. 
sorry, my mind is a uh, daylight savings. Okay. All right, and so the reason I did this is that this looks like a Neusel number, right? And so we have another expression for Neusel number, but we have uh, something that's different over here, right? So first we have two times 0 0.332. And so this is 0 0.664, okay? This L to the one half, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna um, pop it right into this, uh, uh, into this expression here. And so we have U infinity times L divided by mu, right? So that's gonna be our Reynolds number. So this Reynolds number to the one half, and we have Prandtl number to one third. And this formula we're gonna box right here. Right? And what we end up with is a correlation for the average Neusel number for laminar flow over a flat plate. Right, so it looks, it looks very similar. So the only difference is that instead of 0 0.332, we have 0 0.664, okay? So it's just two times, two times that. Or a second? Yes, yeah. And so for laminar flow, the difference is very small. So for laminar flow, just, you just multiply by two and then you get, you get this. And you know, and this is nice because now, because now, you know, if we if we were to use this, right, and we use this to compute h bar, that h bar will be valid for the entire plate, and then we can plug this h bar into our Newton's law of cooling, where q is equal to a times h times t s minus t infinity. Okay. Right, and so in some in some in, in, in so one way to look at this is that this h bar, this average h, this is the h we were looking for this entire time. And so, you know, ultimately, you know, the reason we kind of started this unit is that we wanted something to plug in to our usual Newton's law of cooling, right? But so far we haven't been able to do that because all of our neutral numbers and convection coefficients have been local. But since this is an average quantity, you know, we can plug that in there and we can run our problems kind of exactly the same way as we did before with this average. Okay. All right, any questions on this before we, we do an example? Okay, all right. So let's do let's do let's do an example to see how this all uh, all comes into play. All right. So this is this will be a low pressure a low pressure system low pressure airflow um, low pressure high temperature airflow. All right. So let's say we have air. Okay. Let's say that this air is at a very low pressure. So this say the air is at six. Kilonewtons per meter square. Okay. Well, in other words, um, let me just give the, the better unit. So this will be six kilopascal. Okay. And temperature, 300 degrees C, uh, flows over a flat plate. So we have air that's flowing by. We know it's T infinity is 300 degrees C. Okay. We actually have pressure here. So this, this is not very common, but I, but I did want to show you, you know, what you have to do for, temp, for pressure. Usually, you know, for, for a lot of these problems, I'm going to give you pressures are not going to be a concern. Um, but, you know, I did want to show you a case where you do have to adjust for the pressure because this pressure is actually very low. Because normal air pressure is around 100 kilopascal, so this is this is much lower than that. And we also know the velocity. So the velocity is 10 meters per second. Okay, so it's going fairly fast. Okay. And so that's flowing over a plate. And so let's say the surface temperature of the plate is about air temperature. Okay, so we have a 27 degrees C plate. And so this is going to be a situation where we have heat flowing into the plate, right? So we have very hot air that's flowing over the top of a relatively cool plate. And so heat, you know, naturally likes to go from hot temperature to cold, is going to flow into the plate. So this will be Q. 
what are some of the dimensions of the plate? And so we also know that the plate is, the length of the plate is 0 0.5 meters long, okay? And so let's compute What we want to compute here is the rate at which the, the plate needs to be cooled from the inside to maintain the surface temperature. Okay, and this will be a cooling per unit width of the plate. And so, you know, um, the, the wording of this problem can be a little bit confusing because, you know, what you expect is that this, this plate is going to heat up because, you know, the air is going to heat up the plate, right? But what we want is we want to basically maintain this temperature of the plate, right? And so to counteract the amount of heat that's coming in, we have to offload some of the heat as well, okay? Right? And so this blue Q right here has to equal this red Q, right? And so we're basically going to assume that our plate is in thermal equilibrium, okay? And so what we want to compute is that blue Q in order to make sure that our plate stays the same temperature, okay? Um, but to compute that blue Q, we're going to compute the red one. But, you know, because we're in thermal equilibrium, those two have to be exactly the same as each other. All right, any questions on the, uh, on the setup for the problem? Okay. All right, so let's, so let's compute the red Q. And so from Newton's law of cooling, we know the red Q is equal to H bar times A times T S minus T infinity. Okay. Where the A, we're going to assume we have a rectangular plate. So the A is just going to be the length of the plate multiplied by the width. Okay. And since we're interested in the cooling per unit width, what I can do is I can divide both sides by the width. So we have Q divided by W is equal to H bar times L times TS minus T infinity, okay? Right, and so this is what we're gonna solve for. And so, and so, we, and so you know, we basically divide out the, the W, you know, very similar to how we divide out the area in our thermal circuit problems so that we don't have to worry about it, okay? All right, so let's, and so that's, and so that's basically the formula that we need, right? So we have, uh, we have L, and so L is given to us in the problem. We know the surface temperature, okay? We know the temperature of the fluid, we know T infinity. And so of course, the only thing that we don't know is the average neutral, is the average of convection coefficient. Okay? And so the key to this problem is gonna to be to compute what that average convection coefficient is gonna be. But lucky for us, we have an equation that we can use to solve this. Um, and that equation is the, uh, the equation for the average Neusel number. Uh, okay. And of course, you know, we, in, in order to apply this, we have to assume that the flow is lambda. So let's, let's do that. We haven't gone over turbulence flow. I have I have this caveat here because you know right after this we're going to talk about turbulence. Okay, and so our average Neusel number correlation, n u with a bar, right? we know this is equal to h bar or l times k f, okay? and this is equal to zero point six six four times Reynolds number to the one half times Prandtl number to the one third. Okay. All right. And so we, um, you know, we could compute a lot of these things here, but we're going to have to look up properties. Okay. And so in order to compute the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number, the, uh, the thermal conductivity, we have to look up these properties in a table. Okay. Okay. 
And so we're going to have to use either, you know, you can either use table A4 in the textbook, um, or you can just use the, uh, the food properties calculator that I've, um, you know, that I've, I showed you at the beginning of class. Okay? But in order to use that, we have to compute the film temperature, right? Because we have to um, supply a temperature in order to evaluate these properties. Okay? All right, so let's compute that. And so we have film temperature is equal to Ts plus T infinity divided by two. Okay? And we do that, we end up with the film temperature of 163.5 degrees C. Okay. And so now that we have that, we have the properties of air at 163.5 degrees C, okay? And we end up with the following, right? So we have the kinematic viscosity is equal to 30.84 times 10 to the minus six meter square per second. We have the thermal conductivity. So the thermal conductivity of air at the temperature is 36.4 times 10 to the minus three watts per meter K. And our Prandtl number here is 0 0.687. All right. And so those are all the relevant properties that you that you need okay, that you can look from a table. And so you know while while everyone's kind of catching up, you know I, I will say that I think one of the one of the most annoying parts of this unit. So I think this unit is probably um, I, th I think it's probably the most difficult in the class convection. But one of the things that makes it even more annoying is that you're dealing with a lot of these properties that are that have a lot of decimals. And so. You know, it, it kind of invites a lot of places where you can make, you know, calculation errors, and you know, it's just it's just kind of annoying to copy down a lot of numbers. And so, you know, I want you guys to kind of be aware of that before we before we move forward. Okay, um, and so those are the properties that we have, uh, but we have to make an adjustment to the viscosity because we're at a low pressure. Okay, and so again, you know, most of the time you don't have to worry about this. And so, for most problems, you can you can just take these numbers and just plug them plug them into the uh, plug them into the equation. I don't think I don't think I have a, a I don't think I've ever asked a question on an exam or homework which has no pressures, um, and I don't plan to because it's, it's usually not that common. But you know, but in this case uh, we do. Okay? So because. And the main, uh, the main property that's going to be affected by this is going to be the viscosity. Okay. And the main reason for this is because um, because the density, probably if you remember from your ideal gas law, right, the density of a of a gas depends very strongly on its temp, uh, on its uh, um, on its pressure, okay? and density and viscosity are, are closely related too because they're both fluid mechanical properties. And so, because we're making an adjustment to the density, that also is going to uh, make us adjust the viscosity as well. Okay? Right? And the way that we do that is just we just use the simple form. Right. So we have the new viscosity is equal to our looked up viscosity and this viscosity here is is valid at, at room temperature and so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this by um, by the by the usual pressure so this is normal atmospheric pressure it's 101.33 kilopascal and then we're going to divide this by the pressure that we're operating and so the pressure that we're operating at is six kilopascal. Okay. And so that gives us a new viscosity value of 5.21 times 10 to the minus four meters squared per second. Okay. Right. And so what this, what this basically shows you is that the viscosity is inversely proportional to the pressure. Okay. And so as you lower the pressure, that tends to increase the viscosity. Okay. And so we can see that here. So our viscosity here is about an order of magnitude less or excuse me, an order of magnitude greater than what it was before. 
okay, because of the molar pressure. Uh, but again, you know, this is something that you don't you, you don't normally have to do, and so you know, this is this is just a unique case because we're at molar pressure. But we're going to assume that the thermal conductivity and Prandtl number are are, are okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on on this? Yeah. When are pressures too low? Yeah, how low? Uh, usually, usually if it's like less than half of, of atmospheric pressure, I think that's usually when you have to start uh, looking at it. Because you think if the pressure is half, then the viscosity is going to be twice as much. So that's usually a, a good cutoff point. But, but normally pressure is going to fluctuate anywhere between, you know, if you have something that's on Earth, anywhere between like 80 kilopascals and, and higher. And so in those cases, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make the adjustment because it will make kind of a small impact. Question. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's in. It's inversely proportional to the viscosity. Okay. okay. And so now that we have all of these property values, now let's plug them into this equation right here. And so the only thing that we really have to compute is the Reynolds number. And so we compute the Reynolds number. We plug uh, in u infinity times the length divided by the viscosity. Okay. Right. And so the U infinity, our velocity is 10 meters per second. Our length here is 0 0.5 meters. And our viscosity is given right above there, 5.21 times 10 to the minus four meters square second. Okay. As we plug all that in, we get a Reynolds number of 9,597. Which confirms our assumption earlier, and so this is a this is a laminar this is a laminar Reynolds number, okay? because in order to be turbulent for external flow, your Reynolds number needs to be above five times ten to the fifth. Okay, and so we're we're quite a bit away from that, and so this this flows pretty laminar. Okay? okay, and so now that we have that, we can compute N U. Okay, so N U number zero point six six four times Reynolds number to the one half, times Prandtl number to the one third, okay? We have the Reynolds number, which we just computed here. The Prandtl number was 0 0.687, okay? And so we compute that. We get a Neusel number of 57.4. And so now that we have NU, we can compute H bar. So H bar here is KF times NU bar divided by L, okay? Where we plug in a 57.4 in for that. The thermal conductivity, we looked up in the table above and we know the length is half a meter. And so we have an H of 4.18 watts per meter square K. And so now we can compute Q over W, right? Because Q over W, remember, was H, H bar times L times T um, S minus T infinity, which you, you can swap, you can swap these because to make it a positive number. Okay. And so we plug everything in. We plug 4.18 in for H, or L is 0 0.5. T infinity is 300 and T S is 27. And so what we get is 570 watts per meter. Right. And so this is, and so, you know, besides, besides kind of the adjustment that we had to make for pressure, I think this is a good example to kind of show you kind of the entire process, right? And so what you're going to be doing a lot is, um, you know, you're going to be looking up the properties of the fluids. You're going to plug it into the appropriate Neusel number correlation, use the Neusel number correlation to compute H, and then from H, you should be able to compute any heat transfer that 
I question, so how do I find the kinematic viscosity? And so the, the initial value of kinematic viscosity, the one that I have here, and so this, this came from the, this, can, this came from like an online calculator, or if you look it up in the, in a table in a book. Um, but for this problem, we had to make an adjustment based on the pressure. So because we were, uh, we were acting at such a low pressure, uh, we know that our viscosity is actually gonna be higher than, than what we looked up. And so this adjustment right here is, uh, this is an adjustment for, for low pressure. But again, you know, most of the time, you're not gonna have to do this. Because um, most of the time you're going to be operating at you know at normal atmospheric pressure or or something similar, okay? and so for most cases you can you can just take this viscosity here and just plug that right into the Reynolds number, and so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, but it's only for this problem where we had to make the adjustment here for low pressure. Okay. okay. Any other questions on on this example here? Okay. All right. So that's so that's a laminar flow, and so that's great. Um, Let's go over some other some other conditions. So let's start with turbulence. All right. So now we have turbulent flow over. And if you remember, you know what we talked about um, last time that if you have turbulence, turbulence is always going to enhance convection. Okay. And remember that's because of the chaotic flow patterns and turbulence will, will you know, encourage the heat transfer to come out. Okay. And so, you know, our Neusel number correlation should, um, should reflect this. Okay. And so when you have turbulent flow, um, you're going to have a whole new set of Neusel number correlations. Okay. And so if you have turbulent flow, then, you know, you're not going to use the same 0 0.332 or 0 0.664 that we have above. Uh, and these new and these neutral number correlations will will reflect the fact that you know you should have much higher you should have much higher convection. Okay, uh, but I think a key question here is you know how do we know that we're in turbulent flow? Okay, and so for external flow, uh, for external flow like this, you know where the boundary layer can grow um, uninhibited, then what we say is that uh, turbulence is achieved when the Reynolds number is greater than five times 10 to the third. Okay. And so that's your, that's your credo, right? And so oftentimes we call this REC or the critical Reynolds number. Okay? So the critical Reynolds number is five times 10 to the third. Okay. And so with those in mind, you know, let me give you both, I'll give you the, um, the formulas for both the local and the average neutral number. And remember that these, that these formulas here should express a higher, a higher neutral number. All right. And so the local Neusel number, I'll call it NUX. This is equal to 0 0.0296 times the Reynolds number to the four fifths power times parental number to the one third. Okay. Right, so that's the local turbulent um, Neusel number. Next, we have the formula for the average neutral number. Okay. And so this is NU with a bar. This is equal to 0 0.037, Reynolds number to the four fifths, okay. times parental number to the one third. Okay. Make this a little more like here. The, so the exponent for the Reynolds number should be four fifths on, on both sides. All right. 
And so, you know, let's so let's compare these equations to their to the laminar counterparts, right? And so, you know, I'll I'll just do it for the for the average one. And so, for the um, average neutral number correlation from laminar, we have 0 0.664 times Reynolds number to the one half, Prandtl number to the one third. Okay? And so, this is our laminar counterpart for the whole for the um, you know for the for the flat plate. And so, you might be looking at these two formulas and you'd be like, wait a minute. You know the formula for the av for the laminar case has 0 0.664 out of front, right? Whereas the turbulent one, the the coefficient out in front is 0 0.037, so that's a that's a difference of 20, right? And so if you just look at the coefficients in front, you know it looks like the laminar one is actually bigger, right? And so what's so what's up with that? And so the difference between these two correlations doesn't doesn't really lie with the coefficient in front. Um, that doesn't really make that big a, dif a difference. But what does make a difference is the power at which we're raising the Reynolds number to. Okay? And so since for the turbulent case, we're, we're raising the Reynolds number to 0 0.8 instead of 0 0.5, it doesn't seem like it, 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 that may not seem like it makes a big difference, but it actually makes a, a huge difference. Right? And so what you'll see is that if you plug in Reynolds number, even, you know, even if you plug in the critical, one, so even if you plug in this guy, right, where this is kind of like the transition between laminar and turbulent, if you plug in that number into these two correlations, what you'll see is that for the turbulent one, you get a much higher number, you know, because because of turbulence. Right? And so I want to make sure I highlight it because you know I think you know people all, people usually ask me you know why you know why does it seem like the the turbulent one isn't less, you know, because it has a, a lower coefficient in front. You know, the lower coefficient is to kind of you know offset the fact that this coefficient is is, is like that. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions on on this? Yeah. Oh, it's a X. Yeah. Actually, should be this should be Reynolds number X as well. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So that's so that's uh, turbulence. Okay. And so you can apply this um, this equation when your uh, when your uh, when your plate or when your geometry is either completely turbulent or mostly turbulent. Um, but there might be some cases where you have a mixed boundary layer, okay? Because the way, because the way boundary layers develop over over a flat plate, you know, unless unless you do something to the flow, like you add like a trip wire or something, the flow that goes over a flat plate is always going to start out being laminar, okay? And so in most natural situations, it, it, take, it takes a bit of time for the, for the um, flow to actually become turbulent. Okay? And so if you zoom in, okay, and so let's say that we have a typical flat plate here, we have flow coming in. Okay? You'll, see, you'll see a boundary layer development that looks like this. Right? And so at first, you know, the boundary layer will develop you know, very naturally. So this is, a, this is the laminar portion. And so in the laminar portion, you know, the boundary layer kind of grows a little bit slowly. But once it reaches a certain threshold, and so you know, let's say that at this point right here, you know, the Reynolds number, you know, once we've kind of traveled a certain distance along the plate, right, the Reynolds number becomes five times ten to the fifth. Okay, and so there's there's al there's almost always a critical location on the flat plate or any or any geometry where the flow goes turbulent. Okay, and so once you kind of cross that point. You know, it's it's not it's not a it's not a distinct point, and so you don't see it, but it, you know it happens kind of around there. Then the boundary layer kind of starts growing, kind of uncontrolled. Okay, and so in this portion, what we have is turbulence. Okay, okay. 
And so there, there's a transition. And so, you know, if, you, if you're going to apply this forming up here, and so this assumes that either the boundary layer is entirely turbulent or it's mostly turbulent. Okay. And so that can occur in, in, in a couple in a couple ways. Okay. And so the first way that that can happen is that turbulence happens so early on a plate that it's mostly considered turbulent. Okay. Um, and so I think I think your first the first uh, the first problem on the homework problem two has that case right. And so I think problem two I'm I'm asking you to look at airflow over over a big rig truck. Okay. And so if you actually compute, if you compute the point where it, it turns turbulent, it's somewhere here, okay? Right? And so it's only like, you know, two or 3% of the length of the plate of the, of the truck, okay? And so in those situations where like the, the, the most, like at least 95, 97% of the, of the length is turbulent, you can, you can basically assume that the entire uh, thing is turbulent and just use one of these, okay? And so that's one uh, that's one situation where you can use the the purely turbulent neutral correlation. Okay. Uh, another thing that people do is they what they do is they they call it the trip turbulence. And so what uh, what can happen is that you can put a basically like a barbed wire or some kind of trip wire at the beginning, okay. And what that does is it it, it kind of causes the flow to kind of stumble on itself, okay. So it kind of induces uh, chaos into the flow kind of prematurely. And so if you have a situation like that where you trip turbulence early, um, even if the plate's not that long. And so, you know, let's say that without the trip wire, you know, the turbulence would occur somewhere, somewhere down here, okay? Uh, but because of that trip wire, what we can say is that, you know, this entire plate is essentially turbulent, okay? And so this right here is a trip wire. Okay. And that's not all too uncommon. And so, you know, you might you might have situations where you know, say you're designing like a like a car, right? And so you're designing the, the exterior of a car. You know, there might be some surface feature on the car, like maybe the headlights that are popping out of it, or maybe there's like a there's like an antenna on top of the of the car, right? And so features like that can 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 trip turbulence kind of prematurely over the plate. Okay? Uh, so, but other than that, there might be some intentional reasons you might want to trip turbulence too. Because you know, remember we we know that um, convection heat transfer is enhanced in turbulence, and so you might be you know incentivized as an engineer to add something there to trip turbulence so that it enhances heat uh, heat heat transfer from your uh, from your part. Okay. Um, and so those those kind of outline the situations where you can assume that the entire flow is turbulent, okay? and that's convenient because if you can assume the entire flow is turbulent, then you just use just one equation. Okay, uh, but if you can't. Um, then there's, um, you know, there's another equation that I can show you, which is, you know, which, is what we'll, which is what we'll go over next. Uh, okay, but uh, are there any questions on, on the situations where turbulence can occur? Okay, all right. And so let's go over situations where you can't assume this. And so let's say that, you know, you have a plate, you know, maybe it's not that long, uh, or maybe the flow is, is pretty slow, where turbulence doesn't occur until somewhere like midway down the plate or something, okay? And so in those cases, you have a mix of both laminar and turbulent flows on your plate. Okay? And so we call these situations mixed boundary layers. Okay. And so in these in these uh, in these situations, you know, we can't we can't just use one correlation or the other. And so the true Neusel number for these mixed conditions will have contributions from both the laminar and the turbulent case. And so, I, and I want you to be careful on this because in the notes, I, I have something um, which I, 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 I usually forget to correct this every year and it always causes issues with the homeworks and everything, but this year I remember to fix it. Okay? 
And so the formula that I have in the notes is, is actually incorrect. Okay? And so this is the formula that I want you to use. And so in these situations where it's mixed, then the average Newsel number is given by 0 0.037 times the true Reynolds number to the four fifths. Okay? So that's the overall Reynolds number that you compute for the whole thing minus A, okay, and I'll define A in a second. Okay, so that's, that's not the area. That's just a coefficient A times Prankle numbers to the one third, okay? And so you can see um, for, for the most part here, you know, we have, we basically have the, um, the, um, the turbulent neutral number correlation, right? So we have 0 0.037 times Reynolds numbers to the four fifths, okay, times Prankle to the one third. But what we have in addition to that is a, is a correction factor, okay? And so that correction factor A is, is this. Okay? And so this correction factor takes into account the fact that you know, we, uh, we have a correction for the, for the laminar part. Okay? So this correction is 0 0.037 times Reynolds number four fifths. Okay? But, this is not, but this is not the same Reynolds number as above. This is the critical Reynolds number. Okay? So this is REC minus 0 0.664 times the critical um, times the critical Reynolds number to the one half, okay? Where the critical Reynolds number here, remember, is five times ten to the fifth. Okay? So that's the point where we where we transition to turbulence. And so if we plug in, and so you know because you know the critical Reynolds number is something we can just plug in, we can actually compute this coefficient, right? And so you don't have to remember this formula at all. But I find it easier to remember a formula than a random decimal number. And so if you plug in, if you plug in the numbers for this, then you get a value of 871.323. Okay. And so you plug that in for A right there. Uh, and then that's going to give you your adjusted value. Okay. And so if you have a mixed boundary layer, this is the equation that you should, this is the equation that you should. Okay. So this is so you know I, I find this is this is also a lot easier than the other method that I have um, in the notes too. So you know for a mixed boundary layer, um, you know where you can have both a mix of laminar and turbulent, then this is what this is how you can this is how you can do it. All right. Any questions on on this? All right. And so that's the difference between laminar and turbulence. Um, let me go over a, a, another specialized case here. And that's for flat plates with a constant heat flux. And so up to this point, you know, we've we've made the assumption that our plate is held at a constant temperature, right? And so that and so that works well, um, you know, for for a lot of cases. But sometimes, you know, based on the situation, you know, it might be more appropriate to say that our plate has a constant heat flux. Okay? Okay. And so that basically means that the amount of heat going into the, the plate is the same all throughout. Okay. And this is, and you know, and one, one case where this is useful is if you want to say that, you know, your plate is a different temperature, you know, say at the end versus at the base. Okay. And so one, one case that comes to mind here is like, like a fin. Right? And so we know for a fin, right, like we talked about before, a fin is not the same temperature all throughout, right? So the fin temperature varies from the base all the way to the tip. 
Uh, but what you can, but maybe what you can say for the fin instead is that the amount of heat going into the fin or out of the fin is relatively constant along the fin, okay? Uh, which is also not 100% true, but it's, it's more true than the temperature. And so in these situations, when you have a constant heat flux instead of a constant surface temperature, it changes our neutral number correlations a little bit. So let's look at the let's look at the no, the local neutral number first. Okay. So if n u x is equal to zero point four five three times Reynolds number x to the one half times Prandtl number to the one third. Okay. Uh, and so this is this is um, local. Okay. And then to get the turbulent one, you can you, you can just multiply this by two, okay. or the uh, the average one. So this is the local Newton number from laminar flow. Okay. And then for turbulent flow for local, we have the following. We have nu x is equal to 0 0.0308 times Reynolds number to the four fifths times Prandtl number to the one third. And so that's for turbulence. And so you can see that it, it looks very similar. And so if you if you compare this to our uh, to our iso um, isothermal case, constant heat, constant temperature, um, you know I think the the coefficient for the constant temperature one was zero point um, zero three seven. And so this is very close. And so the difference is that you know it's just very slight. And so this is zero point zero three zero eight instead of instead of that. Okay. Uh, and the and the reason for that is for turbulent flow then the, um, you know, the turbulence tends to dominate more so than the thermal conditions. All right, and so, and so you know, if you have a case with constant heat flux, there's, there's some, slight, uh, some slight adjustments that you have to make, um, but it just, it just basically just changes the coefficient. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, and so the last thing I want to cover today before I, I give you back your exams is the what I like to call the convection problem solving recipe. Okay, and I call it a recipe because it's it's you know we kind of follow the same steps throughout. Um, the steps are a little bit annoying because they take a while to look up everything, but you do kind of follow the same steps for most convection problems. And so I was hoping that we could do one more example today, but we are almost out of time, and I want to make sure I give you guys time to pick up your exams too. And so this recipe, if you follow it, um, will give you a good, uh, it's, it, it'll, it's a good methodology to follow when you want to compute the convection coefficient in a geometry. Okay, all right, step one. So step one of the recipe is to identify the flow geometry. Okay. And so what is the flow gonna look like? Okay. So, so far we've only covered one geometry and so it's just been a flat plate. Uh, but starting on Wednesday, we'll go over, you know, flow past a cylinder, um, flow past a sphere, maybe you have internal flow, right? And so just by identifying the flow geometry is, is the first step, okay? And I, and I, and I, and believe me when I say this, that, you know, this is, this is the step that gets skipped 
95% of the time by people doing these problems. But you know, I don't want you guys to skip this step because it's, it's important because there, there are some situations where you might look at the picture, right? And you might read the description of the problem. And you might think one thing, but if you really kind of think about it and you draw it out, then it, the flow geometry is actually something different. Okay? And so step one, it, it, you know, once you kind of get used to it, it might seem like that's the most obvious one and then you can skip it. But I want you guys to actually write down in your problems, you know, this is the flow geometry. You'd be surprised at some of the situations that you come across, like, oh, you know, I thought it was this at first, but it was something else. Okay, so step one, very important. Okay? Step two. Uh, step two is to compute the film temperature. And so just like we saw in our example earlier, the, the temperature at which you evaluate the properties, things like the viscosity, thermal conductivity, that's really important. And so number two is to compute the film temperature, okay? okay. And uh, once you compute the film temperature, then you're going to evaluate all the fluid properties. So those are things like viscosity. There's things like thermal conductivity, uh, Prandtl number, right? So all those things are going to write down. Okay. Number three, very important step. You're going to compute the Reynolds number. Okay. Um, not only do you need the Reynolds number for the Neusel number correlation, so literally uh, almost every Neusel number correlation has the Reynolds number, and so you're going to need it for that. But you also need to determine whether or not your flow is going to be laminar or turbulent. And this is the step where you make, the, make that determination. And we also have mixed. Okay? So this is a good time for you to, to do that. Step four is to determine whether or not you need the local or the average neutral number correlation. Okay. okay. And that's uh, the way you can decide that is whether you need the local convection coefficient or the average one. And so most of the time you're going to need the average. And so, you know, nine times out of 10, you're going to compute the average one here. Okay. Uh, but there might be some situations where you need to compute, you know, locally what's the convection coefficient here. Um, and that's where you kind of make the determination. But most of the time you're going to um, pick average. Okay. Right. And finally, step five, um, now that you have information from steps one, two, three, and four, right? All of that, uh, all those steps are going to tell you which correlation you're going to use, okay? And so, so far, you know, I think we've seen five, five different correlations for the new number, okay? And so the trick, the, the, kind of the trick for this unit, and, and we're going to look at a lot more new number correlations, the trick for this unit is to determine, you know, which, the, which is the best one for you to use given this situation, okay? And then once you have the, the right correlation, then you just do your computations, and then you can um, solve the problem from there. All right, any final questions on this before uh, we wrap it up for today? Yeah. Uh, I, I just threw a rough number, but we, we, covered, we covered quite a few. So there's these two, there's this one, there's maybe there's like six or seven, but there's, but there's, there's a lot. And we're going to have a lot more too. So, and so there's going to be a lot of correlations for us. All right, any more questions? Okay, and so if you're here in person, um, you can go ahead and pick up your exam. A question here. Uh, and so the exams, well, I'll put them up here on this table so you guys can, can have at it. I have your cheat sheets too if you want that as well. But if you don't want your cheat sheets, you can just give it back to me and I'll, I'll just toss them. But uh, you guys can go ahead and do it. All right, questions. So how can you find the position where the flow turns from laminar to turbulent? Ah, that's a good, that's a good question. And so to find the, the position where that happens, we know that the critical, the critical Reynolds number is uh, five times 10 to the fifth. And so what you can do 
is that you can is that you you know that it's equal to this, right? And so um, you know you can plug in the velocity from the problem, you can plug in the viscosity, okay? and you solve this equation for L C. Okay, so L C is going to be five times ten to the fifth multiplied by the viscosity divided by the uh, velocity. And so that's how you can determine the point at which uh, it turns. Around. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Where is? right here. Yeah, and if you're here on Zoom, so uh, what I mentioned earlier in the class is that um, um, if you're not going to be able to come to class on Wednesday or next Monday, then I I can scan your exams and send to you if you want to see your feedback. Uh, but I don't want to do that for too many people because you know I'm going to be scanning the exams forever. So um, if you can, I, I would prefer that you came you came to class and picked up your exam. Uh, but if you have if you have a situation where you can't come to campus, just let me know, uh, and then I can I can scan it. And the solutions are going to be up in about uh, in about 45 minutes. Yeah, I just need to go back to my office and scan it. Thank you. 